Morgan Robinhood Conference, which kicks off here in New York City tomorrow. And joining us right now, live in an exclusive interview, is Paul Tudor Jones, founder and chief investment officer of Tudor Investment Corporation, Just Capital chairman, and of course, Robin Hood Foundation's founder and of course, a board member. It's great to see you this morning. It's good to see you, Andrew. Uh, we've all been trying to make sense of these markets, of this economy. We see these hot employment numbers coming in, We're trying to understand what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Uh, we're seeing what's happening in Europe. We have the issues in Ukraine and Russia and some of the comments by President Putin. I want to put it all into the mix as as a, as a macro trader. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be doing a master class, we should say, about, uh, ma about macro trading mm -hmm. coming up on Wednesday. What is your take on what's happening in this economy, in this market right now? <coughs> well, these are spectacular times for macro. And great times for macro are typically not good times for, the, for general investment, uh, owning stocks, owning bonds. Macro works when everything is broken a bit. That's when you have the most volatility, when it's really best for the type of trading that I do. So for me, so it's Bad times or good times? Ba bad times. Good times for me are bad times for general investors. And if you think about where we are right now, the Federal Reserve Board is fighting something it hasn't seen really in almost four decades, which is inflation. And inflation's it's a bit like toothpaste. Once you get it out of the tube, it's, it's hard to get it back in, right? And so the Fed is, it's, Fed is furiously right now trying to wash that taste out of their mouth, and they're doing it by raising interest rates. And of course, there's a big calibration question here. Just how much are they going to raise them? How much do they have to raise them? And what's the consequence of that? And typically, for when you have an extreme event like inflation we have right now, the only way to, uh, to get it back in the tube is to raise interest rates to a level. Powell's already talked about pain. I take that as a metaphor for a recession. And if we go into recession, that has really negative consequences for a variety of assets. So which side of the debate are you on? Uh, there is a version of the debate which says it's the Jay Powell version, which is the credibility of the Fed is at stake. We mm -hmm. have to keep going. Mm -hmm. The market's expecting 75 basis points. Then there's the Barry Sternlich position, mm -hmm. uh, a regular here at this conference, mm -hmm. who says already gone too far, uh, that the lagging effect hasn't really caught up. We, don't, we haven't seen it, but boy, are we going to. And by then it's going to be too late. Well, the Fed's really caught between a rock and a hard place. You've got wage inflation at 5.5%. That has to come down to 3.5% for us to get inflation back to 2%, right? There's that 1, one to 1.5% one productivity above the normal 2% inflation, which, allow, which means, again, inflation's got to get back to 3.5%. I mean, excuse me, wage inflation has to get back to 3.5%. And that's really, really hard to do, right? If I just think about... The coal increases we had for Social Security last year, you know, at our company, uh, we're just kind of beginning to talk about what are going to be our wage increases for next year. And so for that compensation level that most Americans are in, or in right. certain, certainly that tier, everyone is kind of expecting us to play catch up for what they suffered this year, and they weren't compensated for at the beginning of last year in salary. So we're looking at wage rises of 5 to 10 percent in that kind of average American comp level. So it's really challenging for the Fed if they're truly uh, going to hit the 2 percent right. target. And I think they should. There's so many long term. So you think he should continue to keep going? 75 basis points make sense to you? You think he should lighten up? What's your? It, well, it's pay me now or pay me later. So if, if they if they don't keep going and we have high and permanent inflation. It just creates, I think, more issues down the road. We went through the greatest period of global prosperity, the greatest period of reduction in poverty rates globally when we had 2% inflation on average in most of the developed world. And it was a real struggle to get there. If you remember, obviously Volcker right. came in, jack rates, we went through, a, we paid a huge cost for it. But even then, after he took rates almost to 20 percent, he still didn't win the fight against inflation. It took a decade for that to, to work its way through. But, so, but if the argument is that it always tips over into recession, are you arguing that is the right decision? 
I'm saying that more likely than not, if we're going to have long-term prosperity, you have to have a stable currency, a stable, in a stable way to value it. So yes, you have to have something 2% and under inflation in the very long run to have a stable society. So there's going to be short-term pain associated with long-term gain, yes. Okay, throw into the mix this. Putin now talking about a nuclear war. How do you, how do you even conceive of that? It's so hard to trade it because it's such a binary event. I mean, if you think about it, we have a, a dictator who's losing, and typically that doesn't end well. It, he, typically that's going to end with a violent death. And the question is, who is he going to take with that, right? Is it going to be regional focus between Russia and Ukraine, or does it expand beyond that? And obviously, um, if you think that the two outcomes have such two dramatically different um, impacts in the markets, if, if, we ha if, if all of a sudden he was gone tomorrow by some coup or something, you'd have this massive rally in risk. And yet if what I think is probably more probable, he escalates the kinetic side of his response, then you have just the opposite, the Armageddon scenario. And I'm not smart enough to know which one. I don't think anyone can accurately predict the outcome of this, right? Is there a trade? I mean, are people trading this? Uh, well, if I just take our company, we make everyone cover their tails. So if you've got, if you've got something that's going to be exposed to, again, an escalation in the kinetic response, whether it's chemical weapons or a tactical nuke or whatever, we make everyone cover their tails because, again, the outcomes are so, so binary and they have such massively different uh, consequences for so many different asset classes. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, I remember you joining us mm -hmm. um, and talking about the possibility of a runaway inflation. And one of the things you talked about then was a hedge around using crypto and Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And your friend, your, your friend Stan Druckenmiller had bought some Bitcoin at the time, mm -hmm. too. Um, Stan Druckenmiller recently had an interview with Joe Kernan mm -hmm. um, at Delivering Alpha, said he's out of Bitcoin. Where are you? I've still got a, a very minor allocation. I've always had a small allocation to it. I think. You know, if you think about every decade, the 70s were the decade of inflation. The 80s was a decade of kind of boom bust, huge swings in dollar volatility. The 90s was equitization, the dot com bubble, the aughts was the mortgage bubble and the great financial crisis. Uh, the teens were the peak of globalization and probably the peak of uh, central bank experimentation with monetary policy, right? Uh, the 20s, I'm afraid, are going to be that period where we really focus on debt dynamics country by country, fiscal deficits, and the need to run certainly fiscal policy in a way that gives people confidence in the long run value of the currency. And the problem that we've had really for the last 12 years is that we've, we've, we've done this massive experimentation with monetary policy where we suppressed yields and we did this massive experimentation on the fiscal side during the pandemic. And so my guess is the 20s are going to be just the opposite of both. We're already seeing that right now from the central bank. We're going to, the, whoever is the president in 24 is going to be dealing with debt dynamics that are so dire and so, so every so dire that w this is 1970s no so dire that that we're going to have to have fiscal retrenchment and that fiscal retrenchment means that um, if we don't have fiscal retrenchment then everything that we spent if you think about the teens which was all about suppressing yields right mm -hmm. I think the 20s will be just the opposite. I mean, higher term premiums in bond markets, higher term premiums in stock markets. It'll be just the opposite of what we experienced the last decade. So in a time when there's too much money, which is why we have inflation, and too much fiscal spending, something like crypto, specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum, where there's a finite amount of that, that will have value at some point, 
someday. I don't know when that will be, but it will have value. That scares me. And the people. value at a, a much higher number than where we are today. Oh, I think so, yeah. Like? I, I would think, there, so we're probably getting ready to go through the, rep the recession playbook, more likely than not. Sometime, I don't know whether it started now or whether it started two months ago, you always find out and you're always surprised about when recession officially starts. But I'm assuming we're going to go into one. There's a specific playbook around that. Uh, and what, what is that playbook? Well, so that playbook is most recessions last about 300 days. From the commencement of it, the stock market's down, say, 10 percent. Um, the first thing that will happen will be short rates will stop going up and will start going down before the stock market actually bottoms. So that's why you could argue that two-year rates here may have some value um, or somewhere through here. Uh, and term premium gets put back into a variety of assets, into bond markets, into stock markets, and that's obviously what's, what's happening. So you're seeing multiples compress in the stock market, as they should, and you're starting to see uh, bond markets sell off because, again, term premiums being put back into them. So I would say when we get into that recession, there will be a point when the Fed stops hiking. There will be a point when um, it starts to either slow down or even at some point it'll reverse those cuts. And when that happens, you'll have just a, you'll probably have a massive rally in a variety of beaten down inflation trades, I want to including bring, crypto. I want to bring Becky into the conversation because she's got a question, but when, when do you expect that to happen? Well, we have, I mean, look, we've got rates at three point, unemployment rates at 3.6%, I believe. We have, it's very possible we haven't even started yet. It's very possible that when the NBR goes back and says, here's when the, the recession officially started, that it'll be somewhere within a month or two of now. Maybe, I, I doubt, again, with the unemployment rate so low that they would, they would date it earlier than this. It's, it's, they look at six or seven different measures, and you're always surprised right. ex post when they do. Hey, Becky? Oh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um Paul, just wondering, we, we, we heard from Ray Dalio, I think it was just a week ago today, that after years and years of saying cash is trash, he thinks cash is not necessarily such a bad place to be. It's, it's an unusual call. I understand there could be dislocations, and maybe that's good reason for it. But when you have such high inflation, average investors trying to play along with that game uh, could get burned. What, what are your thoughts just about cash and whether or not to hold it? I think he's 100 percent right. I mean, that's kind of the playbook that we're in at this part of the cycle when central banks are aggressively trying to attack inflation globally, assuming that they follow through with what they said they're going to do, which is to, again, bring inflation back to a reasonable level. You would unequivocally want to favor cash. You have to think about it. It's so hard to take what we've learned from investing for the past 12 years and put that behind you. But you really have to. It's a different, the market changes. It's a, it's a completely different environment we're in right now. When I think about the quote January effect that we're gonna see next year and all the money that theoretically is gonna come into the stock market and bond markets, it, it, you know, all of a sudden if two year rates are 4.3% or higher, you've got to wonder whether you get the same flush into assets that you normally see in January and February and March that you've had in the past, because all of a sudden we've got, for the first time in 13 years, a really attractive short-term rate, 4.3%. I wanted to ask you about another piece of news this morning, Ben Bernanke uh, just winning the Nobel Prize for Economics, uh, that prize in large part a result of what he did, frankly, when he was 30 years old mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago. But we'll, of course, be brought forward to talk about how he dealt with the, the 2008 crisis. But, of course, people then say, you know, did we stay too long uh, at the party? And then, of course, we had the pandemic. How do you see it? So, by the way, Ken Griffin's interviewing Ben Bernanke, I believe, tomorrow. So uh, our investors conference, our investors conference always has so many great trade ideas of it. You would have been a quadrillionaire by simply following what 
uh, so many of, of our, our great panelists say over the course of, of that conference. Um, I think monetary policy has been, was, was relatively straightforward and somewhat easy to understand all the way until we got to really 2018 and 19 and 20. Um, and that's when it, it went, off the, went off the rails and kind of deviated from orthodoxy. Um, the quantitative easing that we went through from 2011 to 15, clearly that was a stretch, but it wasn't necessarily egregious. It, it kind of, I think, opened Pandora's box. And then, of course, I think this particular Federal Reserve Board has taken it to a new level, and now they're, again, as fast as they possibly can trying to take it back. Uh, and that's why you've got this extreme volatility in the markets. I want to pivot the conversation and talk a little bit about ESG, something you've been talking mm -hmm. about, one of the pioneers in this space for a very long time, mm -hmm. having led Just Capital all these years. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a real politicization of the idea of ESG. You've even had people like Elon Musk uh, call ESG a scam. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have states, both blue and red, fighting each other. Uh, the Treasury of uh, Louisiana taking money out of BlackRock because they don't like some of the policies that they have around uh, climate investing and some of the letters that Larry Fink has written. What do you make of what's happening here? Well, I think the critics of ESG are just, they're, they're as wrong as a frog in a fire. Um, ESG, first of all, it suffers because they have the emphasis on the wrong, wrong syllable. It really should be social governance environmental. Uh, you know, at Just Capital, we poll the American public every year uh, and ask them what constitutes just corporate behavior. And with that, we rank a th a th the thousand largest companies according to what the American public tells us. And many of the things that we ask the public on are ESG components, some of the same things, uh, uh, some of the critical factors we use in our just rankings. And if you just look, and again, ESG has been so politicized and there's so much, and it's really just to serve a lot of people's purposes, I think, as opposed to looking at the facts. So if we take our just 1,000, right. we take the top 100 companies and the bottom 100 companies, since we started calculating the index in 2018, the top 100 companies have returned about 58%. The bottom 100 companies have returned about 14 percent. That's a 44 percent spread on alpha that is derived from looking at many ESG right. components. But what, so what do you say to the pension funds in some of the red states that are pulling their money out of the Black Rocks of the world? But at the same time, you could look at a CalPERS, uh, which, you know, there was a study recently that they took their money. Um, frankly, they said they didn't want to be... Uh, buying into gun makers, there were other uh, tobacco products and other things, and people looked back and said actually that they lost money on those deals, that they should have stayed if their, if their entire purpose, if you will, um, was not ESG, but was simply making a return. So, so, again, staying away from politics and ideology, focusing on the data, I simply look at our just index. And the reality is, is the Just Index has, uh, the top 100 have outperformed the Russell 1000 every year for the past five years. There's a lot of alpha in investing in what the American public says is corporate just behavior. The number one metric, the number one metric is, by a wide margin, is do you pay your employees right. a fair and living wage? And so, again... When I see people attack ESG, right. I'm going, hold it, hold it, wait a second. Democrats and Republicans, rich and poor, young and old, men and women, 85% of Americans agree that the most important metric for just corporate behavior is do you right. pay your employees? I, I get all that, and you know where I stand on a lot of these issues. However... You could look at the fossil fuel companies. We have, we have a guest who's just on the program. We have an actually. energy company in our top, in our Just 100. Again, we, we have to make sure we're defining what we mean by ESG. The most important, the most important metric is how you treat your employees. And, and I don't know who's going to argue with that. 
I want to see the person that's come and tell, gonna come and say, we should not treat them fairly or endeavor to pay By them. By the way, a Elon way. Musk is, is debating this, as you know. Right. Um, and one of the reasons that he was taken out of the uh, S&P ESG fund or, or index mm -hmm. was this idea not that he wasn't on the right side on climate, but that he wasn't on the right side on governance. Right. A again, there's a multitude of factors. And I don't think you can hold every single company on, uh, accountable on every single factor. I think you have to look at this with a broad brush. And should we in be endeavoring as companies and as people to try to sit there and take into account all the stakeholders that are involved in valuing a company, and that is how you treat your employees, how you treat your customers, how you treat your shareholders, how you treat your communities, and how you treat Mother Nature. Can I just, if you, if you said, I've got two tombstones, and I'm either chairman of, a, I'm chairman of the board, or I'm on the board, or I'm a stakeholder in that company, I've got two tombstones at the end of my life. One is, I made an elephant's belly full of money for myself and my shareholders. That's one tombstone. The other one is I treated my employees, my customers, my shareholders, my communities, and Mother Earth with respect. Which one of those two tombstones do you want? Clear as day. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's how... That's how I look at the critics of ESG. They're not thinking clearly. But, but a lot of business leaders who don't necessarily agree with the ESG moniker would say, the only way to run our businesses profitably is to do it that way, the second way you just described. Yeah, I would say there's, again, if I look at the Just 100 and their performance, and I look at what they've done, forget just the stock performance, how many more jobs they create. Right, right. Uh, a whole host of metrics. It's just so clear that the best business is around doing what the American public tells you to do. And that's treat your employees fairly, treat your customers fairly, treat, um, your, uh, treat your communities We fairly. gotta jump, but, but as you can tell, uh, everything's getting set up here for this big conference. Uh, you have an interview tomorrow with Steve Cohen. I do. Talk a little Mets. Absolutely. Maybe some trading. I, I, all I know is I, I'm, I, I wish the Mets had advanced so much. Um, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. He's done so much for that franchise. He's given us hope, given Mets fans hope. So God bless him. I wish they had done better. What else are you looking forward to doing? Well, I'm teaching that master uh, class in macro. And uh, anyone that's there for that is going to learn how to have sleepless nights and get a tick by the time <laughs> they're my age. And uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. That's going to be about the mechanics, not necessarily about markets, but about the mechanics of what you've got to do to uh, create, manage, and follow through on, on a trade. Okay. And it's for a good cause. The Robin Hood Investor Conference, sponsored by J.P. Morgan. Paul, we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. It's always a pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Thanks. Joe? Uh, coming up, Jim Cramer's first uh, take on the trading week ahead. Futures right now uh, indicated uh, up. Squawk Box will be right back.